Hey everybody, in this video I want to share some of my findings that um, I discovered, I don't know, a little less than a year ago. And it regards uh, the book of Enoch and uh, the fall of the angels and the days of Noah. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the book of Enoch and the Nephilim and the fall of angels will, um, will likely receive um, this video. And um, those of you who aren't, um, you could easily read about what I'm referring to in chapters 6 through 10 of the book of Enoch. Um, I will leave all the appropriate links below. Um, there is a study I want to do, but I felt like I wanted to make a separate video and demonstrate this finding that I made um, in a more clear way to not confuse people. So I'm just doing this separately. So a little less than a year ago, um, I wanted to understand where the dinosaurs came from. And um, I found myself intensely studying the days of Noah, um, the fall of the angels, and the days of Genesis and stuff like that. And there was something I found um, in the extra biblical text, uh, specifically the Book of Jubilees and the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, that most people don't talk about and it seems to be a backstory to the fall of the angels that the book of Enoch does not talk about and um, as a conclusion after finding this I'm like I think it's more than plausible but I'm just leaving it on the shelf of my mind but um, later I will post a video in the study of the wisdom of Solomon I found deep encoded in the inspired text a confirmation of this theory that I've held for a little less than a year. And I just want to share this theory so these studies become more clear. Um, so as I was learning about how the dinosaurs, truly the truth about the dinosaurs, and um, you could watch that video in the link below. I highly recommend you do. It came out really good. Um... I discovered something about the fall of the angels that I don't think anybody talks about. And they're just subtle little hints of gems in uh, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs and specifically in the Book of Jubilees. And I want to share this finding. Now to those who are not familiar with the days of Jared and the days of Noah and uh, the days of Cain, the days of Seth, etc., um, may not receive this teaching because it's not so obvious in black and white in the text. But when you study those days and understand what it was like, um, the theory that I want to present in this video, what I found in this video becomes more than plausible. It absolutely makes sense. So before we get into the study, we need to understand context. We need to understand um, what it was like from the days of Cain all the way up to the days of Enoch. Now, mind you, there are two Enochs in um, the early chapters of Genesis. Cain had a son named Enoch, and this is different than the Enoch referenced in, you know, the scribe of the book of Enoch. Um, these are two separate people, so that should be understood. But the general gist of these things, um, our Bibles are pretty general. Um... But they give the basic construct of what there is to understand. And we can get the more specific details in the extra biblical text. So in order to fully comprehend this stuff, you know, you have to dive into the extra biblical text. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch. Um, I don't believe the Book of Yasher is inspired, but it serves as a good commentary and things to consider, um, etc. But let's just consider what our biblical canon tells us about the context that we need in order to comprehend what I would like to present in this video. Um, the Bible tells us that after Cain slew Abel, after some time after that, the Lord gave Adam and Eve a new son named Seth. And Seth begot a son named, named Enos. And it wasn't until the days of Enos that people started calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? 
Um, what does that mean? That means that we could discern the extra biblical texts verify this and, and through really studying and understanding our biblical, you know, the, the early chapters of Genesis, that um, the seed line of Cain uh, prospered and ruled and reigned over the earth um, until the days of Enos. And we know the seed line of Cain was really the first seed line of Satan to prosper through humans. Okay? And things started changing in the day, you know, it wasn't until the days of Enos till people started calling on the name of the Lord. We could see this verified in the Gospels, in the, or in the genealogies, in like the Gospel of Luke, for example. We could see this. So we have to understand this basic construct in order to understand... Um, what I would like to present in this video. Now, though I don't feel that the book of Yasher is inspired, I do feel that it serves as good commentary and it should be taken seriously. Now, in the book of Yasher, specifically the opening verses of chapter 2, it gives us insight to what Genesis 4, 25 and 26 tell us. So Genesis 4.26 says, And to Seth and to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So when we read um, what is told to us in the book of Yasher, chapter 2, um, we could get discernment what it means that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Um, it doesn't mean that the seed line of Enos was righteous. Or it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just says. The Bible just says. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And when we um, consider that. Into what's told in the book of Yasher. We can begin how. To understand how righteousness. Um, began to go forth. Uh, so it's very interesting. Uh, that should be something to consider for anyone truly wanting to grasp uh, the context of this information. Another interesting thing about what's given to us in the account of the book of Yasher, chapter 2, is that we see a foreshadow of Noah's flood. And um, I believe that is quite plausible considering the way uh, God moves or the way that we can discern how God moves. It's through all this context that we have been given through the extra biblical text that we can discern the, the theory that we would like to present in this video. Um, there are no holes. Um, there are no contradictions. And um, everything logically makes sense when putting all the pieces together. So with that said, let's examine the following. So this is the punchline, guys, to the theory that I came up with a little less than a year ago. It's based on two subtle verses. One verse in the book of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Testament of Reuben. And the second one is in the book of Jubilees. Um, both books, indeed, hold their integrity and should be considered as, um, well... The ancients we know considered the Book of Jubilees as inspired scripture. Uh, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, they hold prophecy and truths and revelation that absolutely run parallel to the Bible and are um, vital to our discernment. So if you want to contest with that information, you really have to study the text first um, before we jump to conclusions and criticize. In the text, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Book of Enoch is actually mentioned a handful of times. I've written about this. Um, see the link below. Um, it's a very important article that I wrote. It, it literally proves biblical chronology. It proves that the Book of Enoch is absolutely valid. And what we read of Enoch in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs actually tells us that this book was indeed inspired scripture 
to our forefathers and uh, the sons of Jacob's all the way back then. And uh, it's very amazing when you put the pieces together. Um, it literally becomes irrefutable proof that the book of Enoch um, is absolutely valid. So here we are in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, specifically the Testament of Reuben. There's one particular verse that just um, blows open a whole load of questions that is not mentioned in the Book of Enoch. It doesn't contradict what's, what's told to us in the Book of Enoch, um, but it's not mentioned in the Book of Enoch. Uh, see your screen. Uh, the verse is highlighted on your screen. And this is one of the handful of times that the watchers are mentioned, the fallen angels are mentioned throughout the testaments of the 12 patriarchs. And in the testament of Reuben, chapter 2, verse 18, uh, speaking of the topic of fornication, um, the verse says, For thus they allured the watchers who were before the flood, for as these continually beheld them, they lusted after them. Um... Now, in the book of Enoch, chapter 6, starting at chapter 6, you, you need to be familiar with this um, material. Uh, it just tells us that the angels lusted after the women, and um, they just decided to take on human form, and not only mate with the women, but corrupt the entire earth. And this eventually led to uh, Noah's flood. They begot giants, they begot dinosaurs, they were actually um, animal-human hybrids, it was a living circus. And what did Jesus say? As in the days of Noah, so will the Son of Man be. And this is apparent from what we could see uh, coming in the Great Tribulation. But without getting off topic, um, again, please see the slide on your screen. Uh, the highlighted section is just a hidden gem of, um, it just presents more questions than it gives answers. Or at least so it seems. So as we keep this on the shelf of our minds, we also see another very peculiar verse in the book of Jubilees, chapter 4, verse 15. Uh, it is highlighted on your screen. And specifically, it says, In the days of Jared, the angels of the Lord descended on the earth, those who were named the watchers, that they should instruct the children of men, and that they should do judgment and uprightness on the earth. Now, let's begin to put the pieces together. Uh, number one, the book of Enoch does tell us that the angels fell and the angels came to the earth in the days of Jared. Uh, please see your screen. I will leave the link below for a biblical timeline. Uh, we can see how this stuff is absolutely plausible. And, and notice how this does run parallel to what we read about in Genesis 4 through 6. Uh, the book of Yasher has already discussed that unrighteousness on the earth was just prevailing and prevailing. And here Jubilee tells us that, um, the angels were sent down to earth um, to teach men righteousness in the days of Jared. So this is very interesting. And then consider what we just uh, covered in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. It makes sense that when angels come down to earth and they're in their angelic form that the human women would lust after them. I mean, that just makes sense. And then, so... Here we seem to get a backstory of what eventually led to Noah's flood. Um, what seemed like a righteous cause um, would eventually lead to Noah's flood. Because as the book of Enoch tells us, 200 angels decided to mate with these uh, human women and they, they fell. They, they became human in form and, and, um, and as a result, the giants were begotten. And as a result of the giants, the giants um, took control of the earth and started mating with plants and animals and not plants, I'm sorry, with uh, fish, reptiles and birds. And that's how we could discern the dinosaurs came about. And there were animal-human hybrids and 
here we have the days of Noah, and thus the Lord eventually decreed Noah's flood. So this is a theory. Is it absolutely proven? Is this definite? No, I've concluded this as a a very plausible and likely theory, and I left it on the shelf of my mind. But what I'm going to cover in my next video, not in this video, I just I stumbled upon uh, the inspired text of the wisdom of Solomon. I found a third witness. I found a verifying witness to this theory. And um, I will cover that in my next video. So I hope this is a blessing to everyone. I hope this is clear. It's just I wanted to present this separately before I, I tie this all together and, uh, and share what I have found in the wisdom of Solomon. Thank you for watching. God bless you.